With that, uh, I know you're here to uh, learn from our very distinguished speaker, who's my colleague, John Boyer. John's been a member of the faculty of the University of Chicago since 1975, and he's actually one of the world's experts on um, the history of the Habsburg Empire and Central European history of the 19th and 20th century. He has three books uh, about Central European history, and he's also actually the co-editor of the nine-volume University of Chicago Readings in Western Civilization. Uh, besides being a scholar, he is one of the most important administrators in the history of the university, having served as dean of the college at the University of Chicago since 1992, which I think uh, means that he has been in office for about 20 percent of the history of the college. Um, and today he's here to talk to us about his latest book called The University of Chicago, A History. So please welcome John Boyer. Uh, thank you very much for, um, for the generous introduction and thank you very much for inviting me to come and talk to you. C can everybody hear me? Is that Okay, great. Uh, so I, I, I have about a half an hour, I believe, and I, it's, it's a big topic to cover. I, I'm, um, I've been asked to speak about, uh, as, as Neil mentioned, my, uh, my recent book on the history of the university. So what I want to do is to give a general overview of, um, of some of the uh, most important points or findings of the book. And then um, I know that after uh, uh, a brief interlude, we'll then have an opportunity for some questions. Um, the, uh, the University of Chicago is uh, uh, nowadays accounted to be one of the uh, most distinguished universities in the world. If you look at the r rankings that um, you know, are periodically done by uh, U.S. News or by the uh, uh, Shanghai University, or there's a, a, a group in London called QS that actually just released the uh, world rankings uh, um, this week, um, Chicago is always ranked among the top ten universities in the world. And um, um, it's, uh, it's kind of surprising that we, we have that because we are a fairly young university. Most of the places that are in, in those rankings are places like Harvard or, um, or Oxford or Cambridge that are venerable old institutions founded hundreds and hundreds of years ago. So the story that I want to tell today is how a young university um, in the middle of nowhere, because we were founded um, in, literally on the south side of Chicago in an area of prairies and swampland, how within about a uh, hundred years became uh, one of the uh, leading universities of the world and I think a real asset to the metropolitan community. Chicago as a city and a region is blessed by a number of distinguished universities up in this neck of the woods, of course, Northwestern is a very great university, uh, University of Illinois on the west side. Uh, so uh, DePaul, Loyola, we are, as it were, uh, uh, our cup runneth over with important universities, but um, Chicago uh, managed the University of Chicago managed to become a, occupy a particular niche in, in, the, um, in the kind of annals of higher education. So my story begins uh, with this photograph, and uh, my, my story is really in five parts. So the, uh, the first part has to do with the, uh, what I call the first University of Chicago. The university that I uh, am a member of, and others are a member of now, is actually the second University of Chicago. Uh, first University of Chicago was founded in 1880, 1856 by Stephen A. Douglas, who was a, um, um, as you know, a rather famous politician. He was the Douglas of the Lincoln-Douglas debates. And, uh, but he was also a real estate developer and, a, and a, uh, 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 a kind of entrepreneur. He bought some land on the south side of Chicago near 35th Street, and he, in order to uh, um, both uh, raise the value of his property, uh, because he was trying to develop it for, for uh, commercial and residential purposes, but also to kind of help the city of Chicago would get started. Chicago was a frontier town at the time. Uh, there was this sense that, well, you know, one, one thing you could do would be to add a, a, a college. A college would kind of raise the tone of the place, uh, raise the kind of, uh, literally re raise residential property values. And um, so he invited uh, a group of people from the Presbyterians to create a college on his land. He set aside a, a several acres of land and he put it on offer. Um, Presbyterians did not take his offer. They, they, they had ambivalence about Douglass's attitudes about slavery. Um, and so he next tried the Baptists, and the Baptists were uh, uh, willing and eager to take the land. Uh, this is on the corner of 34th Street and Cottage Grove Avenue, very close to the, uh, what used to be called the Illinois Central, now the Metro Tracks, and then the uh, Lakeshore Drive in, in Lake Michigan. Um, and a university was created. It was a college, a frontier college, a liberal arts college. 
Um, and it was um, open to both men and women. It was uh, co-educational, and it was a, a fine little college. It had about 100 students, and, um, and the Baptists tried to make a go of it, but they were un, un, unlucky, uh, not only because of the Chicago fire that happened in the early 1870s and because of the Civil War that happened in the mid-1860s, and um, you know, when you have fires and civil wars and so forth, the number of students who are available to attend is not, not as great as you might want. And, um, people had promised gifts and donations and then went bankrupt because their buildings had burnt down in the Chicago fire and so forth. Um, so basically the place ran into a lot of financial problems. Uh, the trustees of the university uh, were a fairly irresponsible lot, uh, uh, I would say even feckless uh, to the point of, uh, they, were, they were nice people but they were basically um, didn't know what they were doing. Um, and um, by the uh, mid-1880s, the place is bankrupt, and it, it, it basically uh, has to close down. It, it, it relinquishes its land. It had mortgaged its uh, property to an insurance company. Basically, they called in the debt. Uh, the Baptists uh, uh, at the time, the Baptist community, uh, uh, were very embarrassed by this. They were, in fact, they felt ashamed of what they had not done, uh, namely keep the promises that they had made to themselves, to the city of Chicago, and to the Lord. I mean, these were very devout people. It's very appropriate for me to be talking um, uh, to you this morning, on a Sunday morning, about, about this subject, because you know, although the University of Chicago today sees itself as a secular, non-denominational non university, in fact, it began as a deeply religious university, uh, by, founded by deeply religious people. And so uh, this then uh, kind of moves into the second part of my story, namely how did we get to be uh, 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 refounded? Well, these Baptists were an enterprising lot, and they were basically persistent, and they, were, they felt bad about what they had not done, and they asked the Lord, uh, they asked uh, 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 God, Yahweh, divine providence for a second chance. Now, as you, we all know, Sometimes in life you get a second chance and sometimes you don't. Well, they were lucky. Uh, they were fortunate. They got a second chance. They put together a plan and they uh, went shopping for a new donor. And the donor happened to be, uh, at least that they had in mind, was a probably not only the wealthiest Baptist in the United States, but probably the wealthiest person in the United States, a, a guy by the name of John D. Rockefeller. And John D. Rockefeller did not live in Chicago. He lived in Cleveland and then in New York City. Um, but he, had, he knew about Chicago. He had been helping the Baptists in smaller ways in Chicago and um, founding their, their, their the, a seminary that they had started. And so they, they went to Rockefeller and they said, look, uh, uh, we screwed up. We screwed up. Um, but we'd like a second chance. We want to create another college slash university. Uh, would you help us? And, and Rockefeller was very, very skeptical. He, he, he did not trust these people. He, 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 he admired them. I would say he even loved them in, in a kind of fraternal way, but he didn't trust them. Um, but, um, but what sealed the deal was that they identified a young and up-and-coming academic by the name of William Rainey Harper, who was a, a uh, pedagogue, who was a scholar of Hebrew and uh, philology, uh, 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 Semitic languages. Harper was a man who had gotten a PhD from Yale. Uh, he was a very, very charismatic guy. And Harper developed a plan uh, for a, what he called a brand spanking new university. It was not simply to be a small liberal arts college, but Harper imagined, you know, wouldn't it be wonderful if, if, if in Chicago, in the middle of this great city of, 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 of migration of, of all these ethnic groups, but also in the middle of the country, um, the, not only the economic capital of the Midwest, but in some ways the economic capital of the greater, the greater West of the United States in 1890. Wouldn't it be great if we could have an a, a all-purpose, uh, 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 unified and integrated research university, a university that would have a college for undergraduate students, but that all, would also have a graduate school and develop research on the kind of German uh, tradition, because German universities were very fashionable and seen as kind of models of the time. Wouldn't it be great if we could also then have a business school? Uh, 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 our business school today, the Booth School of Business, is one of the very best in the world. Um, how about a law school? What about a divinity school, a theology school? What about a medical school? And so Harper wanted uh, to put all of these together and found them all at once. And not, nowadays, of course, there are many universities that have an undergraduate college and a graduate school and a business school and a law school. But this was very unusual in 1890 because most universities were basically colleges. The idea of academic research as a way of life, the idea of professional education, especially uh, on a very advanced level, this was very new and very untested. And so Harper came up with this plan, and it was this plan that they took to New York and they sold to Rockefeller. 
Rockefeller, I, I'm not altogether certain that he fully understood what he was getting into um, because it was very costly. He thought he was starting a college and Harper was kind of had these, this sheaf of plans. Of all, he was kind of like a madman, a mad scientist with all of his plans. Um, and uh, he was a fast-talking guy, he was very charismatic, a very, very, very persuasive guy, Harper was. And um, so they eventually got Rockefeller to say, okay, look, I will give you $600,000 to start this enterprise, but you have to do something first. You have to go to the people of the city of Chicago and you have to get a match. You have to raise $400,000 to match my $600,000, otherwise I won't give you the money. And the reason why Rockefeller did this is because the Baptists had failed the first time because they had failed to connect with the people of the city of Chicago. And Rockefeller knew that if he just gave them the money, they would take the money, they would run back to Chicago and spend the money, um, and um, then they would probably end up collapsing again because they would not have put down the kind of philanthropic, cultural, social roots within the civic community of Chicago that they needed to do. And so the Baptists then had to go door to door for a year, literally door to door. Uh, and in our archives, we still have the kind of fundraising books because they would, they would actually you know, go to people on a Sunday morning after a gathering like this, that people would pray and then they would adjourn for coffee and they would pass a, a little book around saying, okay, what are, what are you signing up for? I'll give you a dollar. Well, how about $2, uh, maybe $3, uh, we've got to raise $400,000 here. Um, and eventually, over, over the course of the year, they knocked on enough doors. They went not only to um, all of the Baptists in the city of Chicago, but there weren't that many Baptists. And they realized that um, if they were going to meet their target, they had to expand their horizons, so they went to the Presbyterians. And they went to the Methodists. Now, this, the people at Northwestern did not like this. Uh, um, of course, they, you, know, you should stay away from the Methodists. Uh, but these, these Baptists were, I, I would say, in a very, I say this in a very friendly and not ironic way, they were fanatics. I mean, they, they, they were on a quest from, for and, and on behalf of, 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 of providence, of God, to, to make this work. And they also then went to the Jewish community. Uh, there was a, Jew, a group of Jew, Jewish merchants who met downtown, and it's called the Standard Club, it's still there today, and they basically persuaded them to, to give a donation and so forth. So the more they began to expand their fundraising base, the more they had to play down their identity as a Baptist university, because, the, you know, the, why would the Presbyterians give money to a Baptist university? In fact, you know, let's give money to a Presbyterian university. And certainly, why would Jewish merchants give money to a, a Baptist university that would only admit Baptist students? So very quickly, within the course of about a year and a half, the rhetoric about the identity of what they were doing had shifted from being a Baptist university to being a kind of, I'm saying quite literally, a kind of semi-religious university that would be welcoming to all faiths, all faiths in the sense that uh, what Harper used to say is searching for truth is searching for God. So that the extent that I or my colleagues in the business school or anywhere else search for truth, we are doing the work of the Lord, we are doing the work of God, we are, it's a kind of a highly rationalistic perspective on religion, um, and that anybody who searches for truth can come to this university, that's, 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 that's the kind of bar, the religious bar that you have to jump over, searching for truth. You don't have to pray, you don't have to sign a dogmatic statement, you don't have to, you know, um, uh, swear this or that, you just have to search for truth. And, and, and from that perspective, the university then, as you can imagine, with several years, well, okay, well, who, anybody can search for truth. People from Asia can search for truth. China can search for truth. Uh, uh, people who, uh, 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 who, who are, who are even are, are not Christians or Jews can search for truth. And so very quickly, within 10 to 15 years, the, the identity of the university had be, be kind of settled into being a non-denominational university, and over time, the, the emphasis on formal religion simply, it did, never went away, but it simply kind of receded into the background in a very natural way without anybody saying, well, we're not a religious place or we are a religious place. It simply happened over time by the fact that they had to communicate their, their cause to a group of people who were not of their own faith, and I mean not Baptists. Um, so the place started, uh, we built a, um, this was the, the first, uh, 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 first University of Chicago. This is the building that Douglas helped to build. It, it basically had to be mortgaged and sold away. And um, our, our um, what am I doing here? Okay. Our founding president, this is William Rainey Harper. Um, this is the this young charismatic guy who fast-talking fast entrepreneur who talked 
Rockefeller, and Rockefeller is, is, is in this picture walking next to Harper with a piece of paper in his hand. This is, I, don't, I, I, I kind of, I want to believe that's kind of Harper's plan that Rockefeller is walking around with um, to create this totally integrated university uh, all at once. Uh, Rockefeller only visited the University of Chicago once, and uh, because every time he, 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 every time Harper saw him, Harper asked for more money, and so R Rockefeller basically said, "Look, I don't think I'm going to come back again. Th thank you very much." Uh, but in fact, uh, he was very generous. Uh, over the course of his life, he gave the university the equivalent of, um, if you count his donations, the donations that his son John D. Rockefeller Jr. gave, and then the donations that the Rockefeller Foundation and the other Rockefeller charities gave. Um, there's something in today's dollars of about three quarters of a billion dollars. And, and uh, you might say, well, okay, that's a lot of money, but it's not a lot of money. Uh, and, and for us, it's, I mean, for me, that's a lot of money. Um, but um, you, you really couldn't start a truly great international university even with that amount of money today. But you have to remember that, that that was in those dollars. Those dollars bought a lot more back then than they would buy today. Harper. Uh, went to Berlin when they were starting the university. They needed a library, so he goes to Europe, visits an antiquarian book dealer uh, that had you know, several hundred thousand rare volumes, and he buys the whole collection for about $40,000. Uh, I mean, today, you, there are no collections like that to buy, and, and it would cost far more than $40,000, even adjusted for inflation. Okay, so what the university does is it, um, it settles on the, the south side of Chicago, they do not go back to the old site. They felt the site on 34th Street was jinxed. It was kind of haunted. And uh, they could have gone back. The insurance company that had the, the, the first building I showed you, I mean, it was still there. They basically said, hey, you want it back again? Come, you know, pay us the debt you owe us, and you can have the building back. And they said, no, uh, uh, we don't want to go back there. And what they decided, they would move farther south. And they moved to a place called Hyde Park. Hyde Park Kenwood, which was at that time a kind of luxury suburb. It was kind of like a, like a Kenilworth or a, uh, a, 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 a Winnetka of, of the south. At least that's what the folks who lived there wanted it to be. Um, and, um, and the Baptists, who were themselves very modest people, these were actually rather poor people, um, but they, 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 they were shrewd and they knew, well, if you put a university where the wealthy people are, that's not a bad thing, you know, because they would see it and maybe they would help it. And so it starts out on the south side of Chicago, around 55th, 56th Street. They got some land donated by Mar Marshall Field, the, the department store owner. Um, and, um, and, uh, and basically, they were able to make the match uh, that Rockefeller wanted by getting some of the civic elites, uh, people like Marshall Field and, and, uh, and the men and women who basically created the Art Institute, the Chicago Symphony. There is a set of institutions created um, cultural institutions in the city of Chicago in the 1890s, the kind of gilded age of, 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 our, of our history of our city, that are all created at once. The Chicago Symphony celebrated its 125th anniversary last year, the same as the University of Chicago. And the, the same people who founded the symphony actually helped found our university. Now, the, the, they started out with a, the working uh, uh, with Rockefeller's money, and this was enormously important because Overnight, we became one of the wealthiest universities in the United States. If you look at the value of endowments of, of, of U.S. universities, by 1910, Harvard is number one, Columbia is number two, and the University of Chicago is number three. I mean, this is astonishing for a place that didn't exist 20 years ago, or 20 years before. Um, Columbia and Harvard are very venerable colonial colleges that had grown up over time and gotten a lot of support from their alumni. Princeton, Yale, Stanford had, were not yet really on the map. Uh, they become uh, educational powerhouses in the 20th century, but, but at that time it was basically Harvard, Columbia, and then Chicago. Um, but Chicago had something else other than um, just money. Uh, it had this plan, this idea of a completely integrated university, and this was something that was rather new, and it actually <laughs> turned out to work rather well. It enabled Harper to attract a very distinguished faculty, so he went around the country with Rockefeller's money and he, he, he undertook what were called raids. And a raid is when Harper showed up in town and began to contact the faculty of other colleges and universities and say, you know, like, uh, uh, are you really happy in your job? Uh, uh, you're being paid $3,000, how would you like $7,000? Now, $7,000 was a lot of money back then for a professor to get. Uh, you could actually buy a house on, you know, 
uh, maybe have, even have a, a servant or two uh, for $7,000. And uh, so he's able to attract a very distinguished faculty overnight. And, and, and we know this because in the 1920s, when, when rankings begin to be undertaken, these, these rankings of, 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 of uh, the quality of faculty, Chicago is ranked really number one along with Harvard in terms of the, of the quality of our fa faculty. And these, these people came because they wanted to do research, because they were, they were very much uh, attracted by Harper's idea of, of a research institution as opposed to just being a teaching institution. That they, would, they, they certainly were going to teach, but the idea of being a research university, which was very new and very, very unusual in American life in the late 1890s, uh, was very attractive. And it's also enabled us to attract a rather interesting group of students. Um, because Harper wanted to have a graduate school and a professional schools, um, this meant that we overnight began to attract older students to our campus. This was not simply a kind of college filled with late adolescents. Um, and this is very important for the culture of the university that it's always been a, a kind of ensemble of older and younger students, uh, more or less nowadays almost evenly balanced demographically. And then he set out, he needed some undergraduates, and, and he was a very proud person. He had been trained at Yale. Um, he, he, he was a, a, a Midwestern guy, Harper was, a, born to a poor family in rural Ohio, um, and the kind of, kind of Horatio Alger type. And um, he, what he liked about Yale was the, was the academic work that he did, but what he disliked about it was that he, there was a sense of Yale at that time as being a kind of finishing school for wealthy gentlemen, a kind of, kind of, uh, kind of um, country club kind of thing. Um, and Harper didn't like that. He thought that was elitist. He was anti-elitist. Uh, and he was very merit-oriented. And so what he wanted his university and college to do was to be, uh, first of all, uh, both co-ed for men and women, but also he set the admission standards to get into Chicago higher than Yale and higher than Harvard. So you had to pass a test and you had to do this and that and so forth. And he, he was intent on kind of showing everybody that he could create a college that would be filled with the most brilliant students that he could find uh, that would be better than Harvard and Yale students, or at least that would be, uh, who would be more earnest and more serious about their studies. And actually, it ended up working uh, uh, rather well, so he attracts a group of undergraduates who come to the university not to join fraternities or sororities. We ended up having these, these kinds of organizations, um, but, uh, uh, but who came to the university on the promise that they were actually going to get a good education and then ha would have an impact especially in the Midwest, become professionals, uh, uh, business people, uh, teachers, uh, educated a lot of school teachers. I think many of the, the principals and assistant principals in the Chicago public school system before World War II were educated at, at the university. And all of this creates then a, a, um, a, a very successful operation. And this leads me then to the third uh, kind of era, and, that, and that's the era between the First and Second World Wars. Harper dies in 1906, unfortunately, dies as a young man, uh, at 50 years of age. But, but he's done what he needs to do. The university has set its anchor, and it's, it's this for a very young but very wealthy and successful place. And then a couple of things happen that kind of amplify its reputation. Uh, one is that um, they were very fortunate in the 1920s and 30s to attract a group of scholars, especially in the social sciences, um, who began to develop what came to be called the Chicago Schools of Sociology, Economics, Political Science. Uh, these were um, ensembles of faculty who uh, focused on particular research issues. In the case of sociology, it was the study of the city. Um, in the case of political science, it was a study of political behavior and uh, political psychology and elections. And um, basically, they began to shape the disciplines and shape graduate education in a way that by the 1930s and 40s, if you really want to do the very best graduate work in the world, you come to a place like Chicago. You don't go to Germany anymore. I mean, Germany by that time was you know, occupied by the fascists and Hitler, and Hitler was destroying the German universities. But even if that hadn't happened, the American universities, led by Chicago and by, and by our peers, begin to come into their own as centers of distinguished scholarship, the like of which um, the world had not seen before. And so that, that, that's one thing that happens, and that's a good thing. Second thing is that we ended up having a, um, another young guy, and this is a, a guy by the name of Robert Maynard Hutchins, becomes president in 1929, and Hutchins is probably, uh, most certainly along with Harper, our most famous president, and Harper Hutchins, unlike Harper, is a national figure. He's a figure who 
if you uh, write about American cultural history in the 1920s and 30s, uh, you're, you're going to be interested in Robert Hutchins. Hutchins was a dean of Yale Law School. Uh, he's a very young guy, very ambitious. Um, he's invited to become the president of the University of Chicago in 1929. Right on the, on, right, he takes office two months before the Depression uh, breaks out. And, um, and um, he uh, has an enormous set of ambitions for the university. Um, some of which worked, some of which didn't work, but his, the, probably the two most important um, notions were, first of all, that uh, not only what a university should be, but also what it should not be. He was very much against vocational education and very much uh, believing that universities were about the, what he would call the life of the mind. And, and so that the, to the extent that uh, you, 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 you know, you've associate the University of Chicago with academic seriousness, with kind of Nobel Prize winners, with this kind of powerhouse of ideas. This is really a, uh, a rhetoric that, that is, is really formally kind of placed on the university by Hutchins and Hutchins' speeches and the way he talked about the university to the, to the public. He ends up on the cover of Time Magazine several times. He ends up being a very vigorous defender of academic freedom at a time when Defending academic freedom, both for faculty and students, is a very unpopular thing to do. And the red scares of the 30s and then the bigger red scares of the McCarthyism of the 40s and 50s. Hutchins is a national leader in defending academic freedom. Why do you do that? Well, because a university is a place of the, the mind, of ideas. You have to be free to have uh, a debate about ideas. Uh, if you can't defend your ability to be free, you're not a real university, and therefore you have to start with the idea of academic freedom even before you, you think about what a university should be. And so Hutchins uh, gives the university a kind of um, an identity. And presidents, powerful university presidents, have the ability to do this. Uh, at least they, they used to have the, the ability to do this, to kind of shape their institutions. Um, the other thing that Hutchins does is to create on the college uh, what's called the core curriculum, general education. And Chicago becomes very famous, along with Columbia, in the 1920s and 1930s, for a set of courses that introduce young students, freshmen and sophomores, to the work of, of the university, not by putting them in department courses, uh, courses taught by specialists in departments, but by creating a series of general courses uh, called the core curriculum that would then um, be a kind of transition between high school and college. And um, the, this is important for educational reasons, but it's also important on, on a national uh, level because it gives Chicago, and I would argue probably Columbia University and well, a kind of distinctive brand um, that it can then uh, associate itself with that in kind of a loopback effect begins to define the place um, as, a, uh, as a, 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 a very innovative leader in undergraduate education. Harper was a fairly conventional person. He just thought you should, you know, he wanted students brighter than the ones that went to Yale and then they should come to Hyde Park. He didn't really have really innovative ideas about how to educate them. It's with Hutchins in the 1930s that you get that. And so, but so far, you know, the, uh, by the, the end of this third epic, by the time of Pearl Harbor, Chicago is, has emerged as uh, one of the great universities in the world, certainly the great universities in the United States. We have a distinctive identity. We have wealth. Uh, we have a fine uh, 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 situation. We're in Hyde Park. It's, it's, it, Hyde Park does not end up like Kenilworth or, or Winnetka. It really ends up uh, as a, uh, just a kind of a fairly uh, uh, middle class, uh, lower middle class uh, uh, area of the city but, but filled with fine, earnest, hardworking people. Um, I myself was born in, in, in Woodlawn. My, my, my father and mother lived on 66 in Dorchester, and I was, I was born in what used to be called the Illinois Central Hospital on Stony Island. Um, my father was a truck driver, so he was not a you know, wealthy person, but there were plenty of people like that who lived in Hyde Park in Kenwood. Um, and this becomes, in a way, a kind of golden age for the university. By, by, by the time of Pearl Harbor, the late 30s, early 40s, Chicago has really had a very good run. Uh, and I think if you were a, you know, uh, if, 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 wherever Har Harper was, he died in 1906, but you know, let's, wherever he was, let's say he's up there as opposed to uh, down there in, in, in a Christian terms. Um, I think he would feel very proud of what he had done. The fourth part of my story is actually a less happy one. Okay, what, what, and this is what happens to the university after World War II. We, we, we had a pretty good war in a kind of studs turk way. You know, um, we went to war. Uh, uh, we didn't have ROTC on campus. Chicago was always proud of that. Well, we actually once had ROTC and they left because there weren't enough students who were interested in joining it. Um, 
I, I, I say that with some regret because I was an ROTC and became an Army officer, and I think it's uh, not a bad thing to have that kind of training. But anyway, we didn't have that. But we, we went to war in a different sense. We had the Met Lab. We had the, you know, Fermi. We had the uh, atomic bomb experiments and so forth. The university becomes a, a kind of a, uh, a think tank uh, for, for modern science. Um, and, um, and, um, and that seemed promising. But after World War II, a couple of things happened that were very unfortunate. First of all, the neighborhood begins to change very rapidly. Um, and this is the story of the um, elimination of, of, um, of the uh, discriminatory housing covenants that prevented African American families from moving into uh, uh, communities like Hyde Park and Kenwood. Those were overturned by the Supreme Court in the late 1940s. And so you see a very shift, profound shift of population, not only in terms of ethnicity and race, but even more importantly in terms of class, because many of the poor, many of the African American families moving into Hyde Park were very poor people. Uh, and they were, um, and so that the, um, you end up with a kind of class, class conflict between the people living there and the people moving in. Uh, that resulted in, in what comes to be called white flight. You've all heard about white flight, and, uh, uh, and, 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 and white university professors can flee too, and we're fleeing uh, and, and, and because of these changes. Um, the, it's a very controversial topic. I've written about it, I think, I hope, with fairness and some dispassion in, the, uh, in my book, but then you can, re if you're interested, in, you can read the book. Um, so that begins to um, uh, affect the university. Crime rates go up by the mid-1950s. The area around the university was the second highest crime uh, er area in, in the city of Chicago. Um, and um, you end up with uh, people moving out of the neighborhood. There was a real sense that the university could not survive uh, because the, um, uh, for, uh, with all of the complexity of these issues, uh, that if you're going to sustain a faculty uh, and, and a great university, you have to have a stable neighborhood, stable, uh, good public schools, and so forth. Um, and this looked rather bleak. Second thing that happened was that Hutchins, um, who was a, again, a, a, a brilliant guy, but Hutchins had a, was convinced that, um, it, as it were, kind of a last uh, intervention, that he could uh, change American higher education profoundly by changing the demographic structure of American colleges. He was convinced that American high schools were doing a lousy job educating young people, and that what the colleges should do is intervene and take them out after their sophomore year of high school. And we should uh, begin then to admit 15-year-olds, bring them to the university, give them a bachelor's degree in four years, 19, kind of uh, uh, four-year wonders, as it were, kind of like 30-day wonders in, in the Army, and then send them back to the labor market so you could become a, 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 start your medical school, law school, business career at the age of 19. He thought this was a great idea. And he went around talking to all his fellow university presidents. He said, you know, he went to Harvard, Yale, and Princeton. He said, I've got a great idea. And, and these other guys looked at him, and of course they smiled, and they said, Bob, that's a wonderful idea. And um, of course, what, what Hutchins forgot to, what he forgot is that university presidents are paid to smile at people and say, that's a great idea. All the while, they think this guy is nuts. Uh, and um, so um, he thought that if we started doing this, everybody else would do it. We started doing it. Nobody else did it at all. They thought he was nuts. And it was a total disaster. And so and what happened was that the high schools began to hold back their students because no high school principal wants to lose their best students after two years of high school. Our undergraduate enrollments plummeted so that uh, from a college of almost 4,000 undergraduates in the 1930s, we ended up with less than 1,300 by 1955. And this was a, a financially a, close to a death blow to the university. So the combination of these two factors, changing the neighborhood and then the collapse of our undergraduate college demographically, um, really uh, meant that the university had a very hard time in the 50s and 60s. Financially, if you track the size of our endowment in 1950, we still had a very robust endowment. We were the third or fourth biggest endowment of all American colleges. By 1980, I think we had sunk to 12, and then by 1990, we were down to about 17th, because there's a direct relationship between the size of your student body and the size of your endowment. If you don't have students paying tuition, that's a problem. If you don't have students who graduate, who become alums, who give you donations, that's a problem, and it eventually affects the university greatly. And so um, the period after 1945, really until the 1980s, is not a golden age for us. There, there is a, um, uh, a, a whole literature now on the history of American higher education after 1945 that call, calls this period the golden age of American higher education, especially with Sputnik in the late 50s. The federal government gets into providing huge amounts of money 
and so, oops, I'm destroying your microphone, uh, to, to, to American higher education. Uh, you have all these new universities, especially in California and, and New York being created. It's, it, they had a golden age. The University of Chicago had a, it did not have a golden age. We had a, a, an age of, uh, of, a, of, a, of famine, not feast. And um, um, the university remained a great university, but there were, there were signs of slippage. We began to lose faculty. We, we were not recruiting students. We also um, uh, paid a price for having all of this philanthropy having come from the Rockefellers. Because if, you, if it's so easy to go to New York and go to Mr. Rockefeller's door and knock, 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 um, and hold out your hand and you know, get millions of dollars from the Rockefellers, you tend to be become lackadaisical or complacent in terms of the way in which you relate to your own alums and you relate to the civic elites of your own city. And, 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 and the university struggled for decades with this uh, a lack of connectivity to its own alumni and to the civic elites of Chicago because it was so over-reliant, in my view, on New York wealth. Rockefeller money in the first instance and then after World War II on Ford, uh, money from the Ford Foundation. If you look at the donations of the Ford Foundation, which was a huge operation, in the 50s and 60s, next to Harvard, we were the, certainly the largest um, uh, uh, receiver of gifts from the Ford Foundation, which was a good thing, but again, ironically, a, a, an ambivalent thing. My final uh, uh, part of my story is a happier one uh, with the, um, the uh, taking office of Edward Levy in, in the 70s and, as president, and then, and then I think perhaps even more importantly, Hannah Gray in the 1980s, the university begins to rebuild. And it rebuilds in two important ways. It had always maintained very strong doctoral programs, and you have this, this kind of heritage of these Chicago schools on the doctoral level. It's still, Chicago's still famous for, for, the, for the, this kind of research. Um, but two things begin to happen. First, um, uh, a new set of actors come on the scene, and that's the professional schools. Uh, um, um, uh, you know, I'm delighted to have been invited by a distinguished professor from the Booth School of Business to speak to you today, because Booth is actually also a new boy in the block. We, we had a business school from the 1890s on, but it was basically an undergraduate business school. Uh, most of our business school students up to World War II were undergrads. Um, that changes in the 1950s. The business school basically changes its, not only its stripes, but its identity, transforms itself uh, through the support of the Ford Foundation, uh, not, not the support, the, the, the Ford, Ford Foundation that commissioned studies about business education in the 50s. And Chicago was lucky to get a set of leaders and recruit a set of faculty in the 50s and 60s that had the idea that basically business education was not simply teaching people accounting and so forth and so on, but it was also a kind of an applied social science in and of itself that finance was, was not simply uh, um, teaching undergraduates, you know, finance 101, but you wanted to have a faculty who would be distinguished researchers. Uh, and you wanted people like a George Stigler or a Arnold Davidson in accounting. And so what we end up having at, at, at Chicago, and, and, and you see that the same thing happens with our law school as well, is that they reinvent themselves into a kind of applied social science institutes. Even today, uh, I think it's fair to say that most of our faculty in, in our business school do not have PhDs in business. They have PhDs in, in what we would call economics or, or in, the, in the arts and science, psychology, economics. Same is true in the law school. A very large number of our, of our legal faculty actually are also cross-trained in, in economics or history and so forth and psychology. And so the professional schools come into their own in a very powerful way such that the identity of the University of Chicago today is in some ways very much associated with the Booth School of Business or with our law school. This was not true before World War II, but it is true today. And so professional education um, becomes very important. And secondly, the college is rebuilt, uh, really from the ground up. Uh, we get rid of Hutchins' ideas about admitting 15-year-olds. We don't do that anymore. I, I, mean, I have nothing against 15-year-olds. I, I have three children, and they all were at one point 15 years old. And, I, and I'm glad they stayed in high school for four years. Um, uh, but we have basically quite deliberately uh, invested, uh, restructured the college such that today that the college is now um, about the size of Yale, about the size of Princeton. We've recovered this demographic losses, and, and it's now ranked in the top five colleges in the United States, along with the, uh, the usual suspects, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, et cetera. And so that the, this restructuring of the university, emphasizing professional education in a new way on the one hand, and rebuilding the college has enabled the university to come back from this perilous, uh, uh, kind of, uh, what I would call almost a financial death, death march uh, that we were in in the 1950s and 1960s. And today, it's been a, um, a place of, um, it's still a place of great, um, 
great distinction, but also I think with, with a much more optimistic and a much more uh, 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 stable future. Finally, uh, I, I might just say something about um, uh, uh, why I came to write this book. This is a, a picture of Hutchins and his father, and um, uh, uh, I, uh, another picture of Hutchins. Hutchins was also a, um, uh, a great, great speaker, but uh, the, the picture of Hutchins, Hutchins was a, was a, a bit of a nepotist. He, he, he came from Yale, but he quickly became a Chicago, and he believed he, there was nothing wrong with hiring your family. Um, and um, this is uh, Hutchins giving his father an honorary degree, uh, which, is a, uh, which is a native Chicago, and I said, I understand that totally. I, uh, my grandfather was a precinct captain in Woodlawn, I understand that totally. <laughs> Uh, and, and here he is again, uh, a captivating, intriguing, and, and, uh, and a fa fascinating figure. Um, I, I came to write this book, and, and there are copies out there. I'm not here to peddle my book, although I understand they have copies, and I'd be happy to, um, to, to, uh, to sign copies, uh, because I think it's important that in the, in, in the times in which we live, in which there's so much controversy about the universities and higher education, financing of it, why does it cost so much, uh, uh, you know, why do we um, have all of these controversies over free speech, trigger warnings, um, all the things that are happening in higher education today? Um, I think it's important that we, we, as citizens, understand something about the history of these, of these places. They, if, you, if you go abroad to Asia or to Europe, uh, you know, and right now the Asians and Europeans are not worried about the universities. They're worried about who's going to become the next president who have control of the nuclear codes. Uh, but um, and I'm not going to say anything more about that this morning. But, uh, but one of the great achievements of, of America in the 20th century is the creation of these great universities. I mean, we are, what we have done, what we as a people have done is really quite stunning. We've created the greatest universities in the world, and we've done it in a rather short period of time, and we are envied. I'm literally envied by, by people in Europe and Asia who want to be like us. There's not a week that goes by, certainly a month that goes by, that I and my peers do not receive delegations from China or from Singapore or from Japan or even from Europe. You know, they come in with their computers wanting to know how they can make their university into a top ten university. I mean, there's something about what we have done. Northwestern is a great university, and people who live up in this neck of the woods, you should be extremely proud. Even if you're not alums of Northwestern, you should be proud that it's there because of what it represents and what it does. Um, and yet, we have this um, ambivalent relationship to our universities. Uh, we're not funding our public universities. The public universities are slowly, and some of them are going bankrupt or, or feel that they're going bankrupt. Um, there was stories in the news recently about the funding of, of public universities in, in Illinois. Same is true elsewhere. So we as a people, it seems to me, need to think about these universities and colleges because they're so much a part of our civilization and they're so much a part, in my view, this sounds somewhat self-interested, but I think it's fair, a fair argument, of, 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 of success in our civilization, of what we have done uh, and what we can do. They are not only the sources of enormous uh, research that's good for our, our nation and our people, but they also help to educate a citizenry that is, and certainly education is not something that is, we can ever take for granted. Uh, and and to the ability of our citizens to work through, to generate leaders who will then work through difficult problems and tell the truth to the American people about what needs to be done, even if the American people don't want to hear the truth, it seems to me universities have to play a role in, in this. And, and to do that, they have to be effective. They have to be not only well taught, but, but well organized and well funded. And so I really wrote the book not so much as a, uh, an exercise in pride, but an exercise uh, really um, I was kind of curious, well, you know, I, I kind of know the story of one of these places. There are many other great universities, so I thought it might be useful, salutary, to try to tell its story and perhaps encourage other, other historians to tell the stories of their universities. So that over time, if people are willing to read the, at least, or listen to, um, uh, to, to like talks like this about them, uh, that we might gain a greater understanding and appreciation of what we have and how we should not squander what we have, how we should protect what we have. Certainly take care of it, demand accountability uh, and, 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 and living up to the mission and promises they make to their donors and to their, to their uh, parents and students, but also that we should protect them because they are true treasures in American life. So I want to thank you for your attention. I, I don't know if I've run over the time or I, I'm about the time, but, but I, um, I, 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 I'm happy to take questions, but I understand there's going to be a pause for us. So thank you very much. Uh, can you uh, 
uh, crystallize your opinion of of uh, the uh, dichotomy between practicality and idealism that Hutchins embodied. Yeah. Okay. The, the, th thank you very much. So Robert Hutchins was a um, uh, not only an icon iconoclast, but he was an ideologue, and, and the uh, uh, the the ideology was basically the idea that um, um, education was something that was so fruitful and so rich and so 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 uh, so valuable that uh, you should do it for its own sake. Uh, and he tended to be somewhat denigrating of, although I mean, he wasn't undermining of, but he, was, he, he wasn't particularly supportive of the idea of vocational education or even professional education. Uh, and um, the, the, the problem um, that, that he faced was that um, the uh, students like yourself, uh, you'd come there, but eventually the day would come, they'd give you the piece of diploma, and then, okay, good luck. Uh, so what are you going to do with your life? Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> My own view about this is that the <clears throat> it was um, I mean I firmly believe that universities are about teaching people critical skills of learning and and uh, certainly discourse and and not only how to articulate their own ideas but I think equally important how to listen to other people's ideas and engage them in fair and dispassionate ways. That's all. That's all. We owe that to Hutchins. I mean, so Hutchins certainly stood for that, and I'm very much supportive of that. On the other hand, I think it's um, unrealistic to expect uh, students nowadays uh, and their parents to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, of tuition, which people are doing now to attend all of these great universities, if, if they're not on financial aid. Um, and even people on financial aid are paying a lot. And then the parents ask me as dean, what's going to happen to my child after they graduate? And, and, and you say, well, Gee, I don't know, uh, or, 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 or you know, I'm sure it'll be okay. This kind of language is, uh, parents just look at you and, and, and like, 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 are you kidding? Uh, like, I mean, can, can you give me a couple more sentences as to what's, what's going to happen to my kid? And this is particularly important, not so much for people who are doing, uh, if you're an undergraduate business program like at Notre Dame, that's no problem. They, you know, they, have, they have an answer, but if you're at Chicago and you're studying philosophy or English, and, and the parents say, what's my kid going to do with an English degree? Um, we have to have answers to those questions. And if we don't have answers, what's going to happen is students are not going to major in English. And we, and we don't want that to happen because we value the humanities and we certainly value the liberal arts more generally. So what we've done, and I think a lot of schools are beginning to do it, we've taken the lead on this, is to try to <clears throat> be very uh, aggressive in helping students begin to make choices about career outcomes. And uh, we've developed a whole set of summer internship programs. This coming summer, we'll have almost 2,000 paid internships for our students, really directed toward kids in the humanities to try to explore careers in the summertime, uh, beginning to uh, think about what kind of training they need. Booth has been very generous, uh, um, uh, and he's a professor at Booth. We now have lots of our kids taking a, an accounting course at Booth just as a free elective. And even humanities students can learn something by taking an accounting course. It turns out when they go on the market, try to get a job at Google or someplace like that. The fact they have a course from his colleagues, even though they're philosophy majors, that this, this actually helps a lot. So there are ways that one can kind of soften Hutchins' message without kind of undermining the message. Um, and, I, and I think the universities are, are having to think more seriously about this. I think it's a way of protecting the liberal arts rather than undermining the liberal arts. And I, 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 I think that Hutchins would probably be looked at what, I, what I've done is with some skepticism. But I think, I think it's necessary, and, and, and I think it's the right thing. On the other hand, he was a great man. Uh, he, um, like many great men, he took a lot of risks, and um, he, he, some of them came, paid out well, and some of them were disastrous. And, and you know, it's part of the, the richness and lore of the university that we have presidents like that. Hi, thanks so much for your talk. I have, I have two words in my head that either do or don't go together, hopefully. Um, but you can riff on both or neither. One is policy. What are sort of public policy, federal or state, that matter to you guys, whether it's about student grants or uh, research or whatever, um, and how do we understand that as lay people? And the second is the for-profit movement in higher education. And is it a matter of not letting public money go to students who are in for-profit schools to help keep that viable or whatever? So I'm curious about your thoughts about for-profit, yeah. uh, higher education, and public policy. Yeah, uh, let me take the first, uh, the second first. The, the um, for-profit you're talking about, like University of Phoenix and operations like that. Okay, um, I, I think, you know, there's a lot of controversy about, about the, these, these uh, for-profit colleges and, and universities. Um, <clears throat> some of it is um, 
um, deserve it, and some of it's probably not. Uh, I, I, I think the um, um, we actually had a talk uh, recently by Jim Heckman, who's one of our Nobel Prize winners on particularly this subject, and I think I, I, one of our, our alums asked, you know, shouldn't the federal government somehow pro just prohibit these people from operating because they're 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 they're, um, they're, um, <coughs> they're selling, selling a false product and so forth, and, um, and I think Heckman's response was the right one, namely that. Probably it's, it's, it's not for us to put them out of business, uh, but it is for us to educate people as to whether they want their business or not, to make it clear to people what they're getting into and, uh, and what more, more likely what they're, like, what they're going to get out of these operations. Um, I think if, if, if folks had a clearer sense of, um, of the opportunities that they could get elsewhere, uh, uh, and I, I say that with a footnote because if, if, if we defund the public universities, then what opportunities do a lot of people have elsewhere? I mean, you know, the, the, it's between a rock and a hard place. Um, um, but if, uh, I think the real answer is to give more education and more information about the, the limitations of some of these for-profits, and then hopefully that uh, we can persuade the American public to strengthen public education so people can actually get a decent degree and not have to avail themselves of, of the, those kinds of operations. So there, there are some, um, you know, uh, some of the for-profits like the variety do a good job. I mean, so I, I don't think you can cast them all in the same pot, but, uh, um, now, with regard to public policy, um, I mean, I just, you know, alluded to, you know, certainly, I think every university has a, um, here, you know, we have a global presence, we have a national presence, and then we have a local presence. When I think of public policy, I start with the local because I, you know, this time of troubles that we had in the 1950s with our own community, uh, the, the urban renewal, uh, rebuilding, um, uh, having to rebuild Hyde Park, which was done successfully. You know, Hyde Park today is Obama's Hyde Park. It's the Beloit's where you, on 53rd Street where you can see your food. And, and we were, you know, they, they have the table there where Barack Obama ate his uh, vegetarian omelet or whatever. Um, and you go into Valois, which is a wonderful place. You, you all know what I'm talking about? This is this cafeteria on 53rd Street, still very famous. <clears throat> you go there on a Sunday morning. It's a, it's a, it's a kind of a, a you know, African American, a, a Latino, white uh, men, women, young, old university students, old time high parkers. It's kind of a, a, a kind of symbolic. Uh, <clears throat> time capsule of the new Hyde Park, and everybody seems to be pretty happy and well-employed and, and, you know, uh, doing well and so forth. That's not the Hyde Park of the 1950s. And so, uh, for me, when I think about public policy, I think, you know, what are we doing to contribute to support local schools, um, uh, our local communities, in terms of advocating for them, uh, developing charter schools, as we've done, to try to uh, stabilize, and, and not just stabilize, but to improve the neighborhood around us. Um, and so, um, uh, and, and I think the university with the new urban labs, we've developed this, a new set of initiatives to try to take on big problems in our own city in hopes that the crime, um, education, health, environment, uh, using Chicago as a laboratory. This is very much in the tradition of the Chicago schools in the 1930s and 40s, um, but hopefully to help um, uh, to the extent that we, can ever, we ever have a, a working state government anymore, which we, we do, do not have right now. Um, and um, we can, we, and a, and a, and a, uh, uh, a stable set of, of, of local government actions that we can begin to take action and improve, um, uh, take action on the, on the chronic problems of our own city. I, I, I think this, our university needs to worry about our own community first before we try to solve the problems of the world, frankly. Uh, but the, for me, the biggest problem facing us um, is this issue of um, the future of the public universities. I mean, the, the, there is a real crisis out there. Um, it's, it's easy to think about, if you look at the rankings, you know, Berkeley and UCLA, well, you know, they're, they're, they're very high. And um, if you use the Berkeleys or the Ann Arbor's, University of Michigan, or the um, UCLA's of the world, you can say, well, yeah, it's not so bad. Like, you know, they're, they're doing okay. Uh, but in fact, those are very rare instances, uh, kind of almost countervailing instances of, of, of a different set of trends. And the, um, if you talk to deans at places like the University of Kentucky or Louisiana State or you know, you know, big public institutions uh, uh, in the University of uh, South Carolina, these are red or, red or blue states. Forget about you know, the color of the state or the color of the politics. Um, <clears throat> these are very hard times. Kids are having a hard time finishing their degrees, getting access to to the proper, proper uh, the tertiary level education. And, and, and I, I think, as I said in, in, in my talk, I think that uh, we owe it um, to, to ourselves to, to talk about this issue as, 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 as effectively as we can, not just to say, well, it's, you know, it's, it's just another set of problems. 
because this is our problem. The privates do have a, have a role in, in, in speaking out on this issue. <coughs> Thank you for such an interesting program. Um, who formed the um, Great Books curriculum? And also, what is the status of um, Scheimer College today? Um, the Great Books uh, was a, um, um, the, 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 the idea came uh, in the 1930s with, um, it, it wasn't just associated with Chicago, it actually came out of a, a group of people from Columbia, from the University of Virginia, um, uh, who, the idea was that to, uh, one way of, creating more coherence and more discipline and more rigor in undergraduate education would be to focus on the reading of original text. And, and, and the text that you chose, if they were significant enough, could be called, they were books, and then they would become great books. So the, the idea would be that um, you would have a, instead of giving a, a lecture to 500 students about Aristotle, you would actually have them read Aristotle. Uh, and, and, and they would be confused, and they wouldn't know what it was, but it, 10 weeks later, they would know something as a, as opposed to just you know having it go in one ear and out the other, or, or, or copying somebody else's notes, uh, um, and so that and then if you work through um, Aristotle and Plato, and you know you, you could choose any you know, any prominent book, that you, you would not only uh, recover a sense of where people came from. There was a kind of a, a cultural issue of, of, of establishing a, a intellectual roots that America's American civilization was you know it, it surely came from someplace. And it came from this old world that had kind of screwed up in World War I. Maybe the, so in some ways, Western civilization was now on the banks of the Hudson River or on the, on the shores of Lake Michigan. And we should try to save it, so, for even not only for ourselves because the Europeans were botching it up, um, but also by having people read these books, you would learn to think and critically. What Hutchins did was to say, that should be our core curriculum. And so he tried to change the, the general education courses, which were not great books courses originally, um, into that, the faculty basically rebelled, uh, and they said, we, we, we want some books, but we want also scholarly articles. We want to take kids out. If we, if we read Adam Smith, we want to take them to a steel mill or to an orphanage or to the Board of Trade. Hutchins thought that's nuts. Like, why? Just read the book. Um, but these guys were Chicago school empiricists, and they wanted to blend theory and practice in their classrooms. Uh, eventually, um, um, Hutchins lost that battle, and, and you end up with the founding of St. John's College in, in, in Annapolis, and then there's a branch in New Mexico, um, and those become the kind of classic great books curricula. The great books as a commercial project is, is um, university ended up being um, the recipient of some stock uh, from William Benton for Encyclopedia Britannica, and in the late 40s and 50s, they made a deal with the, the EB to um, actually uh, create the great books and then sell them uh, door to door as you would sell the Encyclopedia Britannica. And that's how the idea gets out into the, you know, the broader um, realms of American life. And, and you know, there were thousands of American families that would buy the great books and put them you know, in a bookshelf in their living room and, and hopefully read them or at least look at them. I don't know. But it's an interesting question of what people actually did with those things. Um, uh, today, um, there are some universities that still have a core curriculum, Chicago and Columbia does. Um, our, core, uh, our core courses are semi-great books. We, we, we read great books, but also we read books that may be great in 100 years. Uh, most universities have abandoned the program, sadly, and, and, which I think is unfortunate. And, and, and there is a, actually a lot of chaos now in American undergraduate curricula, and, and, and somebody needs to do something about that as well. But I think, first of all, we need to try to protect the public universities. <clears throat> yes, please. <clears throat> In the picture you showed of Hutchin, not, not Hutchin, Harper and Rockefeller, yeah. uh, some of the buildings in the background looked to me like uh, residential structures that could, in principle, still exist. Do you have any notion of uh, just where the picture, that, that's the one. Um, yeah, I, I think that they were, um, I think they were walking along, um, I think it's Woodlawn Avenue. And uh, I think the residential structures are, um, if I'm reading it right, the, um, the, uh, w when Harper um, um, recruited the early faculty and paid them $7,000, which again was a very large salary at the time. Most academics earned like $1,000, you know, $1,500. These were enormously inflated salaries. Uh, one of the things that he also did uh, was to basically promise them, um, it was a bit of a smoke, kind of bait and switch, uh, uh, they, could, they could also have houses. 
And so that if, if you go down to um, Hyde Park today and drive along Woodlawn Avenue, you'll you see a lot of these large red brick homes. They're not quite mansions, but they're kind of like small mansions. Those were all the houses of the full professors at the time, and they were built, they all kind of popped out of the ground. Harper had one himself, uh, and his widow lived there until she died in the 1930s. And, um, and so the, the ambient culture of the place was not only that you would become a professor and very famous and have a high salary, you'd also have a, a kind of mini, mini mansion with, with, uh, with a, maybe one or two servants and so forth. I, I think that, the, I think, uh, I'll have to check, but I think they're walking along the street with some of those mansions in the background. Yeah. Uh, thank you for a great talk. You mentioned that, that there's a lot of chaos and controversy about undergraduate cur curriculum, and I wondered if you could expand on that, please. Yeah, the, the, um, uh, what, what's happened, um, in, in my judgment, um, over the last 30 and 40 years is that um, um, you, you basically have um, coming into um, positions of authority and, and, um, and responsibility, I think pr probably responsibility would be the better word, um, basically um, a generation of faculty who got their PhDs in the, 50, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, uh, who went to colleges uh, at the time when most of these colleges were, were getting rid of their core curricula and getting rid of their general education requirements so that you, you um, and the, the, mo the most extreme of these cases, and, and again, I, I don't mean to offend anybody if you're a graduate of Brown University, but Brown becomes famous for basically having no requirements. I mean, my son went to Brown, you know, basically, um, and he went to Brown because he had been, um, a um, student in our lab school from K to 12, and the lab school in Chicago is kind of like a version of the college with all of our, you know, we have a lot of requirements. And, and he was very much enticed by, I think that's enticed, um, by the fact that he could do whatever he wanted at Brown. And, um, and you know, what 18 or 19 year old doesn't want to do that? Um, and, um, and so, but Brown, Brown is, is, is not the only school that, in a sense, uh, ends up with a very, uh, I would say, a very uh, loose collection of what's sometimes called distribution requirements where you just kind of pick, pick a little bit of this and that and so forth. Um, and um, what I worry about is that the, um, w without in any way impugning the quality of the teaching that goes on in the individual courses, these are all high quality places, they have very distinguished faculty, and most of them have very dedicated teachers, so that on, on, on a kind of very micro level, you know, you're a student in somebody's class on whatever, and, and I'm sure you're learning things because the faculty member is a dedicated person and so forth. But what I, what I worry about is that there's a, um, a, a lack of uh, a, a sense that a 18-year-old freshman and a 22-year-old senior are different kinds of people, that, and, and that what you need to think about is the progression that ought to go from first to second to third to fourth year, and, and, and the and abandoning structures like core curricula that Chicago and Columbia have, I think what a lot of our colleges, they're kind of mixing populations at times when populations should not be mixed. I think that freshmen need to have a certain kind of education that's different from seniors. Um, and um, so that what I'm really referring to is more the, the absence of what I would call controlling structures in American higher education, not so much the individual courses. The courses are fine, and, you know, and, and courses will change based upon individual faculty preference. The other thing that's uh, becoming less common is uh, a core curriculum like Columbia Chicago's depends upon faculty as a group collaborating. So you have to sit together and decide how you're going to teach Aristotle. I'm not an Aristotle specialist, but I, I actually teach Aristotle and, and uh, I'm, I teach in our History of Western Civilization core course and, and the first quarter on the Greeks and Romans, we have passages, I'm not, not, so I have to have some help from other people who know about that. So the, 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 General education teaching is collaborative teaching. People, faculty have to work together. And um, there's not enough of that in American higher education. There's a, a lot of kind of single actor uh, stuff going on. Um, and so and, uh, is, is it, is it life-threatening? No, but I think it's, a, uh, I think it's a, 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 a missed opportunity. And I think universities need to go back and revisit um, those issues. The problem is, is that you're dealing now with faculty who are largely tenured. They, you know, they, they, they have academic freedom. You know, you give people the, there's a logic to it, and, uh, and, and, and it's important that people have academic freedom, otherwise we don't have great universities. But with it comes the sense of a kind of, well, I'm just going to do whatever I want, and, you know, let the next person do whatever they want, and, and the kids can either, you know, farewell or farewell not. So th that's really what I was referring to. Yeah. <clears throat> I, uh, I am a graduate of the University of Chicago, and it was there that I learned to argue. Uh, I think that's one of the purposes when you talk about discussion, 
l learning to listen and to discuss with other students. But the reason I went to the University of Chicago is because I began with the survey courses at Wright Junior College, mm -hmm. which, which uh, parroted the, uh, the system of general education, the survey courses, right. biological sciences, social sciences, the humanities, uh, I forget what else. And it was there that I learned what I was really interested in doing. And so when I went to the University of Chicago, I majored in geography, which I had no knowledge of when I was in high school. It was a miserable preparation in high school. Right. So I'd like to, I'm, in a way, I'm disputing the abandonment of those survey courses, of the value of those courses. My first two years in college were spent with that kind of education. Right. And then the last two, I specialized, but I was directed to do that by my experience as a freshman and sophomore at Wright College. Right. Uh, but you, uh, I don't know, I'm disputing in a way uh, what you're saying about, uh, about the value of that kind of education. Could you comment further about yeah, it? Yeah. No, uh, so one of the things that um, happened uh, in the 1930s as uh, Chicago and Columbia began to develop these, uh, I, I call them core courses, they originally were called survey courses, we're talking about the same thing, these are these general courses that introduce students to broad areas of the humanities, the social sciences, uh, and uh, using original text, uh, some great books, some you know, contemporary scholarly documents um, in small group discussions. Um, the, the, the movement began to spread to the junior colleges, and so you end up with some of the local, what we would call now junior colleges, adopting similar curricula. Um, and it shows the, 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 the kind of power that a great university can have in terms of shaping or influencing other kinds of institutional operations as well. Uh, I, I, I think that they're valuable. We, we still believe in them uh, because I think that um, as I said in response to my, the earlier question, I think that where an 18-year-old is is very different from a 20-year-old. I mean, those of you who have children, most of you have children, you know, you, 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 we kind of collapsed late adolescence into one big pot. Well, the 17-year-old is very different than the 20-year-old developmentally uh, in terms of the experience, life experience, but also in terms of knowledge. Um, my, my own view is that we, we recruit, and I'm sure Northwestern does too, lots of smart 17-year-olds who are also very ignorant. I mean, they're, they're, it's not their own fault that they're ignorant. They just don't know things. Uh, they, not, to, not only do they not know things, they don't know how to know what they don't know. And one of the job of the, of our, one of our jobs in the first year, uh, and I think even the second year, is to introduce them to these broad areas of knowledge, skill development, uh, uh, you know, before giving a kid a book and say, choose a social science course, we ought to explain what social science is to them, okay, um, including geography. And then in the second two years, you can do all, a, a lot of other things. Then, then the wor world of the second two years, junior and senior year, becomes more like almost graduate education. And, and, and one of the things that's very nice about Chicago, and I, I, I assume it's the case in Northwestern too, is that a lot of our juniors and seniors are taking graduate courses and professional school courses because they're well trained in the first two years in these survey courses. They kind of know how to think, they know how to argue, they know how to defend themselves, they know how to, when they're, when they're, when they're being conned by some you know, crazy argument. Um, and so it's, it's perfectly reasonable, it seems to me, then that they could go on. And so you can imagine restructuring American higher education, you know, grammar school, middle school, high school, and then the first two years, and then the second two years kind of collapsing them into the first two years of graduate or professional school. And Chicago has actually done that. We used to have a program with Booth where, um, where people could actually double count the senior year. You could get your, you, uh, uh, you, you would enter the business school in senior year, uh, do that, and then do one more year at MBA. And uh, 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 the business school abandoned that because they, they this was about 15 years ago, they found they couldn't place these young MBAs. Who wants to hire a 21-year-old MBA? You know, that's, that's a different question. Um, but the, the idea of mixing and changing the structures of American education is something that I think we ought to be open to. We did it in the 1930s. I mean, Hutchins was a real revolutionary. He was kind of like just taking all the Lego blocks, you know, throwing them apart and then putting them back together again. And, and we need more of that kind of experimentation uh, nowadays, and I, I think that we're, we're not seeing enough of it. I think that's the, that's the price. It's not just that we're not teaching survey courses, but we're not seeing this kind of willingness to take on these structural changes. Um, and there'll be risks. Some, some experiments will work and some won't, but it would be, we, 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 we create an aura of excitement about what we're doing uh, as opposed to, I think, just kind of doing the same thing over and over again. I'm going to take the prerogative to ask the last question. 
I, I'm curious what you tell parents who have, uh, you know, high school age kids, because it, it, it does seem like getting into college is so much more stressful than it used to be. Uh, it seems like a little bit of a lottery as to, you know, how anybody gets into places like Chicago. What, what do you tell people with high school kids about how to prepare them for, for college and, you know, what, what lies ahead? Yeah, uh, that's a very good question because the stress levels are, are, are very high. Uh, the, um, it's a kind of a, uh, it's, it, it, the, the image of kind of sitting around the kitchen table and talking with your child and, and it's as if their fate, you know, the decisions taken when they're 16 or 17 are going to determine, you know, where they are when they're 60 or 70 years old. So, and, 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 um, I, I think I have a good answer, but I, I will say that this is a limited, you know, the communication skills here, are, it, it's, it's hard to kind of stand down that kind of stress level. Uh, what I do think is important for all um, parents uh, to keep in mind is that um, I think high school is something that is a very fruitful and important experience. It's formative and it ought not to be preempted, it ought not to be shortened. Um, and there are all kinds of ways one can, um, you know, help one's child become a better student and a, a better, well-rounded student. We certainly want to see students applying to our college who have been involved in sports and have been involved in, you know, musical activities, not just studying 24 hours a day. But I think the um, uh, uh, equally important, I think there's, um, there is a sense, uh, and I think it's, you know, we brought it on ourselves with these rankings, okay, and, and, and Booth lives and dies by rankings in the same way we all, you know, we, we all decry the rankings, but, you know, you go to O'Hare Airport and go to the, go to the, the you know, the, the, the kiosks, and what do you see? You see college ranking books uh, or, or business ranking books. Um, the, America is blessed with a profusion of wonderful educational institutions, um, and it turns out that um, not everybody has to go to Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Chicago. I mean, my son is a professor at Rice University. Uh, Rice University, I'm, I'm not here touting Rice University. It's an outstanding institution. You can get a wonderful education at Rice University, probably even as good as at the University of Chicago. I, I'm that kind of statement of heresy. Um, and, um, and because of the American system of need-based, need-blind admission, um, it turns out that for many, many children, uh, certainly a, a you know, lower middle class, working class incomes, the, the, it's, it may even be cheaper to go to a private college than to a public college. It, it may even, it, it, given the structure of financial aid. And so I think what people really need to do is to work with their counselors, think strategically, not, I got to get into Dartmouth. If I don't get into Dartmouth, my life is over. I mean, that's the kind of a, I, I don't know how that got started. It's, 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 I think it's an insane uh, notion. Um, because uh, not everybody's going to get into Dartmouth. Dartmouth is not right for anybody, but, but there are probably 10 or 15 institutions that are Dartmouth-like enough. That you can get in a couple of them, and you can have a, get yourself a very fine education. Thank you very much. He omitted the last 25 years of the, the university during which uh, he's been the dean of the college. and. Uh, the College of the University of Chicago has undergone a transformation while John's been the dean. It, it uh, has grown enormously. It's become essentially a place where, you know, the admissions rate was, I don't know, 40, 50 percent probably when you started, maybe 30. It's now 8 percent. Uh, it's one of the most desired uh, colleges uh, in, in the country, and I, I think a lot of it has to do with his leadership. So, um, you. You downplay that in the book, but I, I will encourage you to read the book. It's it's uh, fascinating. There's a whole bunch of stuff that he didn't talk about, and as we said, there'll be uh, copies available to be uh, purchased outside during the coffee hour. Let me now give you a.